Ephesians chapter 3 is where we're going to be. And while you're turning over there, I want to read this, which comes in from Ephesians chapter 2. That chapter 2 and chapter 3 really have to be understood together. So I'm going to just read through chapter 2 and let Paul's words really be what leads us into the message today. As for you, this is Ephesians chapter 2. Come in with me on chapter 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in his mercy, gave us, uh, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, because of this, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, by those who call themselves the circumcision, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who once were far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Is setting aside his flesh, the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. And consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. In just a moment, we will read Ephesians chapter 3. We read a little bit of it as our morning scripture today, but I, what I want to stop and talk about is I want to talk about God's salvation. Sometimes we call it the plan of salvation. And I want to take it from the personal to the community. Today is all about the community. What community are you rooted in? What community do you find your roots in? How do you define yourself by your community? This might be a tough message for some of us to hear because 
we're going to look at some pretty tough things that are, oh my goodness, we've been struggling with them, it seems like, all our lives, and we continue to, every time we think we're making progress, an event happens, something happens, and we realize all the work we've left to do. And so if you if you struggle today, if this message feels like a bit of a struggle, the subject matter, I, I want to comfort you with this. We have not been struggling with this for the past 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. We've been struggling with it for, by Paul's account here, for over 2,000 years and longer. Getting people to come together, put aside their differences, is what Paul is chiefly talking about here. And I want you to think about that. If they were struggling with it, and this was written over 2,000 years ago, that doesn't let us off the hook from our struggles and our problems today, but it ought to put it in perspective that for us to think we're going to solve it all with a law that we can pass or a president that we can elect or uh, economic reform we can make, that's pretty arrogant. I think it cuts deeper than that. And Paul sees that. For Paul, getting people to put aside their differences and come together is not a matter of being a Roman or a, or a member of Jerusalem, someone who's from Jerusalem or Judea. It's not a matter of being a Jew or a Gentile or one who has been circumcised or uncircumcised. That is in the past. That is the past way people define themselves. For Paul, it all comes down to, have you received the grace of Jesus or not? Because it is the grace of Jesus Christ where we find our real transformation, where change can truly happen. And it is the grace of Jesus that is in of itself a humbling thing. That's what Paul sought to convey to them in chapter 2. That your salvation, the reason you're here, Ephesians, the reason why you've been accepted and you've come together to, to be a part of this thing called the church, which is in of itself from the prophets and the apostles with Jesus right there in the center holding everything together, the reason you're invited in is by God's grace. He says it out loud. He says it in bold. Not of yourselves so that you can't boast and so you can't think that you worked your way there. It's an act of grace. And this is huge. This is so huge. Because a lot of our lives are defined by our work. Now, you all know that in order to continue to be here and in ministry, I recently got another job. That's right, I got another day job during the week. I work for a company, and I really, really actually like the job. I like the company I work for. It's got strong family values. It's really kind of an uh, amazing thing. And of course, my favorite thing is it allows me to continue to do ministry here and they don't conflict. And it's, it's really nice. And it's a sales related job. And I have to say now, being in it for about two months now, I have not sold a thing. Thing. It's getting to the point where I like, I being someone who kind of prides myself on making it on my own steam and proving myself. And these are the things that just, I, you know, want to be successful. That starts getting in my head. And here's what I'm hearing over and over and over again from my teammates, from my fellow salespeople, from my boss. Hey, we aren't expecting you to sell anything right now. That's going to come later. We want you to learn. I'm also on this interesting thing over there called a guarantee where I'm not holding up my end of the bargain for the company, but the company is supporting me as I learn, as I grow, as I develop. That's the investment they're putting in me. When I first became pastor here, one of the investments that this church made in me was they helped fund my education. They didn't have to do that, but they made that a part of 
my compensation coming here because they wanted to invest in me and hopefully help me the best pastor that I could be at the age of 21. Yeah. Young, lot to learn. And I know throughout that first year, that first year that uh, Joe Heap used to tease me about calling it my probation year, I know I made a lot of mistakes. I know I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of mistakes in my first couple years. And I still make mistakes from time to time. And sometimes what allows that forgiveness, sometimes what allows that on your part for you to continue to work with me is not a stunning and sterling track record. I may have that now 11 years on, but back in those days, it was grace. We're going to let this kid grow. We're going to see what he can do, and we're going to forgive him and give him a chance to learn from his mistakes. That's grace. Something that you didn't earn yourself but an investment that was made in you all the more. And God has done that for each soul. Jesus did that on the cross when he died for us and extends the invitation of the resurrection to us if we believe. That is what the heart of salvation is. And what we've done with that, what we've done with that is we've made that a very personal thing. And it ought to be. For the grace of Jesus Christ only extends to you if you personally believe in it. You can't be born into it. You can't inherit it from your parents. You can't pass it on to your children. You can try, you can teach them, you can train them, but every person has to individually come to that acceptance of Jesus or, or not. Amen? We believe that. And that's what we mean by you've got to have that personal relationship with Jesus. But I fear sometimes we still we stick on that personal so much, we forget that it's more than personal. Salvation is more than personal. It's also about building community. As a Christian, I had to think about more than just myself. I need to think about others. And who are those others? That was what essentially is at the heart of so many debates and problems in this first generation of church that we read about in Paul's letters, in Peter's letters, in John's letters. They were growing this thing. And they too made mistakes. And often the biggest mistake revolved around how do we bring this group called the Gentiles, essentially Everyone who belongs to it, another nation, another ethnicity, another religion, everyone who belonged to something outside of the remnants of Israel, this Gentile group, how do we bring them in? There were those who said, well, they need to become Jews first. They need to understand our rich history. And that kind of makes sense. They need to really understand the rich history of Israel so that they can all the more understand Jesus himself. It's the reason why we preach the Old Testament. Why do we not just have the New Testament that talks about Jesus and the apostles and go from there? Because we want to understand where that promise came from. They took a step further. They need to be circumcised. They need to observe all our customs. And they need to observe the law. And then they'll really understand all the more Jesus. That's what they thought. And there's some practical problems with that. Going to a 40-year-old Gentile and saying you need to be circumcised is a tough conversation to have, quite frankly. It's a tough conversation. Probably didn't go so well. But even more importantly, people started asking the question, well, why? If this thing is about grace, Jesus Christ came and died for us because we can't make it to God on our own steam, then why are we why are we then putting upon these people who are coming in rules and regulations and you have to be this and you have to fit this size? Why did we why? And the reason why, if you're asking me, one is preaching from Ephesians 2 and 3 this morning, is that's just the way we 
kind of do it as humanity. That's part of our MO. That's part of our problem. We have expectations for how you should play nice in a society, and if you meet those, we'll make so much room for you, and if you don't, we'll kick you out. Every single day on reality television, women in this nation are told that you have to be a certain size, you have to look a certain way to be accepted by men. And that is somewhat, somehow called empowering. And all the Dove campaigns in the world, we talked about this all the time when I was doing my master's in communication, all the heady conversation in the world has not changed the fact that every day in America, young women, young teenage women, develop eating disorders, and they dress more revealing, and they act certain ways because they think that's the way to get a man. And some of you are smiling because you know how true that is. That didn't just happen overnight. That's part of how society works. Right? It's the same reason why so many young African American men watched the draft this past week living in squalor and hurting and often see that as their only way out. Because once again, society's conditioned them to think that way. They don't invest in education. They don't invest in opportunities. States don't invest in their schools. Because quite frankly, there's a way out for them, for the very few of them. And if they make it, we all celebrate them. And the rest are just the rest. And if I had time this morning to go through every single other group in America that has struggled or has been pigeonholed into this fragmented thing called society that we live in, oh my gosh, I don't have time. We'd be here all day, all night, all week. Just a part of the problem that we have had, and it doesn't just go back to our nation, it goes back to Paul's time. It goes back to a group of Jewish Christians who said, yeah, the Gentiles can come in, but they need to observe X, Y, and Z, whether that had to do with God's grace or not. So along came Paul with the idea that, no, we don't need to observe that. We don't need to worry about all the rules and regulations. That's the old way of thinking. The new way of thinking is grace. Grace is what's brought us together. Grace is what makes us a family. Grace is what's put us together as a community. And I want you to think about the source of the person who's writing this to the Ephesian church. Paul was a stalwart Jew. He was a blue blood Pharisee before he came to Jesus. If there was anyone in the world at this time who could have ran with the message of those who were requiring Gentiles to become Jews first, it would have been Paul. That would have been a heck of a niche for him to be in. But he didn't because he realized on that road to Damascus how wrong he was, and he knew he needed to change. He internalized the grace of Jesus Christ and it transformed his life, his heart, his outlook. We have some real problems in this country, in this world. A lot of people angry, frustrated, frustrated about their lot in life, frustrated asking, is, is this all there is? Young people, not just in the Middle East, but from the Western world, turning to groups like ISIS and other terror groups because they're so disillusioned with how lost they are. Wake up! It's a huge wake-up call to me.
And where is the church in all of this? Pushing the same kind of nonsense as those back in Paul's time. Got to sing this kind of music. Got to go to a mega church or got to go to a small church or got to go to one in between. We have turned church into a business that we can manipulate, that we formulate, that we can measure by numbers and statistics and rule books. And in the midst of it, we have sucked the soul out of it. Completely out of it. Because we've taken this thing that's supposed to be about the grace, the incredible grace of Jesus Christ, we turn it around and made it about ourselves and what we like and what appeals to us. And then wonder why people aren't finding truth the way our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents did. You know, I've heard a lot of stories over the years about people back in Arkansas and Oklahoma and even out here in California People who didn't have iPhones and computers, and, and but this not turned into a sermon about anti-iPhones. I got my iPhone right here and my iPad. We're broadcasting over the computer. But I'm talking about a generation that didn't have much, a generation that grew up either in or in the wake of the Great Depression. I've known some of those people. It amazes me the measure of faith that they have. Because when you live in a generation or in a time where it does not matter how hard you work or are willing to work, and you struggle together, community to community, per black and white, and every shade in between, you come to realize the simple truths that hold up the foundations of this world, and one of those is grace. Paul understood that. That's what he's talking about. So now I want you to look at verse chapter 3, because all of this comes out of chapter 2 into chapter 3. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you've heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight in the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. And although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me. To preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in him and through faith in him, we, not I, not you, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. In a few days, we will celebrate the independence we have in this nation, and the birth of this country. This country is actually does have something special about it. A representative democracy and an idea that in this country, whether we fulfill this promise to our children or not, there is an idea that we do hold true that if you are free, that you are free to achieve your dreams. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And it seems like every year we 
wax philosophical about what that means. When I think about what that means, what the Founding Fathers really intended for how this country might go, it's that they were willing to sacrifice who they were, what they had, their wealth, their titles, their influence, to achieve a better way of doing things. A lot of talk about the Founding Fathers of America. One thing that we know is true is many of them were they weren't perfect people. Many of them were wealthy, though, and they put that all on risk with the idea that they could do something better for this newfound land. And rather than stand up here like every other preacher in America and talk about how great they were, they weren't great. They got a lot of things wrong. For one thing, they really did the people who already lived here a great disservice and took us a lot of generations to make that right. We're still working on that. They brought a lot of people over here that didn't want to come over here. They forced a lot of people to come over here. We've been struggling with the fallout from that for generations to come. But what makes us different, what is ideal about the idea of this country, is that eventually we do try to live out the meaning of its creed, that in the sight of God, all men and women are created equal. And what Paul is offering to us here is the actual means at which we can achieve that, at which we can realize that. And that is God's salvation alone. No constitution, no Magna Carta, no Bill of Rights could ever guarantee true equality in the sight of God other than God's salvation itself. And this precious thing that we often think in, about individually coming to accept Jesus. It expands, it reaches so far beyond that, inviting us to become part of one family, <clears throat> no matter who we are or where we are, what we've done, who we've been, where we're going, what our potential is as we measure it ourselves. God sees potential and is invested in all. In all. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family, I love this, every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Oh my goodness. I don't know about you with the words, they just cut right to my heart. How long and high and deep and wide the love of God is. Do you know where Paul wrote this? wrote it in prison. Ephesians is part of a collection of letters that we call Paul's prison epistles. He wrote it in jail. Not a correctional facility in America. Much worse than that, if you can imagine. A Roman first century era jail where he probably didn't have clean water and the food was meager the survival expectation was low. And here he is writing there with the hope and the faith and the foresight of inspiring this church to rally together around the love that is in Christ Jesus. 
to put aside their differences and to realize that through God's salvation, they are indeed one family, one community. I was telling Donna before church, I, I just finished watching a, a five-part documentary on uh, the trial of the century, O.J. Simpson trial. Many of you remember that. I was a lot younger. I, I can remember the chase. I can remember my parents being glued to the TV screen during that chase. And having watched that in the documentary, man, that thing was a way overblown. It's pretty disappointing, actually. They just kind of rode down the road, right? Um, but one of the things that really gripped me as I was watching this documentary was how much that had to do with race relations in the city of Los Angeles. That this gentleman who, quite frankly, has shown his character, whether there are still those who believe he's innocent or not, has shown his character. He is in the Nevada Correctional Facility for armed robbery. So do with that what you will. That he could rally the black community at that time, a community that he sought to keep at arm's length, the community that he himself never tried to belong to before, that he himself moved out of, but now exploited, and his lawyers exploited, so he could get away with what they were charging him with, is really shameful, it's shameful behavior. And I have no doubt that many people have watched that documentary and thought the same thing. How dare him? How dare OJ? How dare those lawyers? And we forget. They were only able to do that because we allowed that to happen. Because for too long, we've allowed our world to be defined by race. We've turned a blind eye to inequality. And we've forgotten that privilege does exist and there are winners and losers. And you know what? As long as we're a part of the neighborhood with winners, we often don't think about the losers. The fact that a, I believe, 14 year old black teen could be shot in the head by a clerk months earlier and the clerk get community service we forget that they didn't have a short memory and they brought those fears and insecurities and that sense of hopelessness about the system and applied it misapplied it to a man who exploited that Perhaps the most powerful part of watching that documentary were all of the civil rights leaders of that time, and many of which who were, and still, black uh, pastors in Los Angeles, talking about how their own people were duped and set back, and how that community became more divided than ever. And I'm sitting here watching this and I'm realizing this, this was in my lifetime. This isn't the civil rights movement in the 60s. And something humbling comes over me. How will my children see these years that I'm living in now? How will my grandchildren think about the world that we've left them, the communities we've left them? How will they weigh the sense of independence that we celebrate with hot dogs and hamburgers and ice cream? Are we committed to improving relationships between the people that live in Fullerton, Long Beach, Anaheim, Buena Park, Corona?
if we still share that dream, that dream that was preached about on the steps of Washington, D.C. by a fellow Baptist minister a generation ago, if we still, more importantly, share a dream that Paul is writing about from prison, that we do indeed all dwell and come from one family that is rooted and established in God himself. If we do want to live in a world where we're not, where we're not hamstrung by the gender we have or the skin color we have or the country we come from, I tell you today, we must find the answer in God's love. We must come together at this communion table, claiming the blood that was shed for us. And we must make room for all to have a place, all to have a seat. Not just those we like, not just those that we get along with, those we identify with, but everyone. And when we fall, when we trip, when we make mistakes, when we stumble, when we show ourselves unworthy of this great task which has been handed down to us, we must not just shrug and say, well, that's just the way things are. They'll never get better. We must rise with the resolve of an apostle who wrote about the wit and length, and height, and depth of love, Jesus Christ. And we must hand down to our children and grandchildren, not the promise of any one administration, or any country, or any speech, but we must hand down the word of God, the truth that is in Christ Jesus, that restores us, and makes us whole, and not as individuals, but as a community of believers coming together. If we commit to that, all our problems aren't going to go away overnight. But we here at this church and so many others who commit to it, we will have a place of respite. We, have a, we will have an oasis in the desert of loneliness and despair. We will have a community for those lost stragglers to find a place in. And today in the 21st century, not just here, but online and everywhere, we have never had a greater advantage to become a part of the work of putting communities back together through the grace of Jesus Christ. We do it every week by sending out our money to our missionaries who are building homes and churches and community centers in Mexico through the works of Here's Life Valley and through the works of CRM all over the world. In this community to get today, we, we meet here in this place not to affirm any nationality, not to affirm any sense of idealism other than for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish and have everlasting life. Whoever, whoever affirms has a place around this table. I know how easy it is to become cynical at the world in the state that it is in. And I know how tempting it is to think selfishly about getting yours and your families. There were so many people in Jesus' time who sought to make him king. Sometimes they would even try to do it by force. but he never gave in. He went to the cross willingly, 
we did that so that we could have a community to belong to, built not on bloodshed, not on the battlefield, but on Calvary. And it is Jesus' sacrifice that overcomes our senses. It is Jesus' death that gives us inspiration to live. And I pray today, I pray today, in the light of events now and past, we will find wisdom in the love of God that surpasses our understanding, that surpasses those who say, you can't, you won't, but instead finds comfort in the one who turned back the clock on death itself. Heavenly Father, today, when I think about Paul writing in that prison cell, the dank feeling of despair around him, the grim smells and meager food, when I think about the temptation to give up, it must have been immeasurable. And Lord, we have felt that as well. Maybe we have not felt that from a prison cell, but we have felt that from watching the TV screen that just once again celebrates all the wrong habits and ideas and ideals in this world and promotes unhealthy lifestyles that, quite frankly, we ourselves in the church have bought into. We have seen it as communities have waged war, a war of words, a war of real words. We have seen it as terrorists seek to claim places in this world. Let us be inspired and seize upon the immense courage of Paul to find hope and strength, to find a future in the love of God the love that you've given us, the love that you've shed on the cross for our sins. And help us realize that this love goes way beyond just making us feel better individually. But it can knit us together and unite us together as a community. That is our prayer. That is our plea this morning. So we go to this table once again together as a community of believers all from your holy name. As the ushers come forward, as we prepare to worship, and this is a time of...